is Entrouded worth buying in early access? Some games that release in early access are absolute gems. They are 100% worth experiencing firsthand, while others release as like completely glitchy, crappy messes that aren't worth buying until the full release of the game and or not worth buying at all. In order to get an in-depth answer to our question, I really want to get into four different categories. We're going to be taking a look at the game as it is today. I also want to look at the game's potential, what we can see happening in the future with the game as far as how they can improve on what they already have. Next, we're going to look at confirmed things that the game promises, what the devs have actually said they're going to put out in the future for this game. And lastly, we're going to be looking at dev activity. Is this a game that the devs just completely forgot about after releasing it? It's just a fart in the wind or are they actually actively trying to fix it and or listen to feedback? If you didn't know already, my name is Guhi. I'm excited to get into the nitty gritties of this game with you today. All right, first off, let's take a look at the game as it is. Before we dive into anything else, I want to go over the Steam reviews of this game. We're looking at mostly positive reviews with the general consensus for the bad reviews being that there are issues with multiplayer. There's nothing technically wrong with the multiplayer issues, at least from what I've experienced. I've only played this game multiplayer and I haven't had any desync issues or anything like that. What people are saying though, is that for it being a multiplayer focused game, they definitely did a lot wrong with the gameplay portions of it. For example, they have server wide progression. Now, if you don't know why server progression is an issue, let me paint a picture for you. Let's say I'm in a server with a ton of people. You can have up to 16 people multiplayer in this game, which is kind of nutty. I'm in a server with three other people People and none of them are on because they're all at work, but I have no life and I want to play games all day anyway. So I hop on and shrouded. I hop on the server and I clear out an area. I get all of the loot and I kill all of the bosses within that area. When the other people get home from work and decide, hey, I want to get out there and start exploring, they go out there and they see all of the chests are already opened and the boss is dead. They won't be able to progress through their quest lines because I've already progressed for them. Even if they're all home and we decide, hey, we should go on an adventure and go kill a boss, if we all go kill the boss together, the boss only drops one boss loot item. So now we're stuck fighting amongst ourselves trying to figure out which one of us is going to get the boss item to upgrade our base. Basically, if everybody wants their own base in their own area of the map, it's a little bit impossible to do. There is a fix or I wouldn't say a loophole. I don't know if it's intended, but if you reset the server, the bosses actually come back to life and the loot goes back into the chests. So you're able to kind of cheese it in a way and go and get the loot over and over again if you keep resetting the server. But imagine in a server with 16 people, you would have to reset the server 16 times in order for everybody to get the loot within an area. Seems like a little bit of an oversight for a game that really is pushing for multiplayer. Not only that, but there's an issue with the NPCs that you get as well. I don't want to spoil it too much, so I'm only going to talk about the very first one that the game guides you to. You get an NPC and he is a blacksmith. This blacksmith now allows you to upgrade your weapons and progress through the crafting portion of the game. You can actually summon the NPCs. This part is cool. You can summon the NPCs and put them absolutely anywhere in the world. Summon them over and over again. You can carry the summoning staff with you, go somewhere, summon them, go somewhere else, summon them again. So it is really cool. But the problem is that you get one of those NPCs per game per world per server. So if you have a buddy that has a base that he thought this biome is cool, I'm going to go make a base over here and you make a base somewhere else, you can only really have the NPC in one place at a time unless you guys are just summoning the poor guy, just wishing him back and forth between bases. Another crappy, I guess, part about the game is if you want to have a dedicated server, meaning a server that will run 24 seven, no matter who's on at what time, then you need to actually pay for it. Or you can use Steam's dedicated servers, but from what I've heard about those from buddies that have done it already is that you have to really jump through hoops and kind of deal with a bunch of issues. Let's move on though and talk about one of the better things about this game and that is the world. Unlike a game like Valheim, which I've heard this game be compared to a ton, this game is not procedurally generated. So every time you hop in, it's not like a different seed. It's been tailor made from the ground up by the devs. Some people have a bad thing in their heads about this because they're like, well, what if I want to replay it? It takes away from the replayability of I'll have already played through the game and already know everything there is to see about the game. But the problem with a seed or a generated procedurally generated world is that it ends up being a little bland. You know, AI is not going to have those extra little details that the devs have taken the time to put together, especially with the puzzles that you encounter throughout the game and the traversal within the game as well is really well made because of the fact that it has been made from scratch. It has intended paths and intended things for you to discover as you explore this highly detailed world. So personally, I think it is definitely a plus that we have a tailor-made world. On top of that, the shroud adds another layer of 
mystery to the world as well. It's honestly not overly complicated. You go into the shroud and you have a limited amount of time in there before you start taking damage. If you leave the shroud, your little timer resets and you can go back into it again. You can get different types of materials and you encounter different types of enemies within the shroud as well. The biggest mechanic about the shroud is the fact that you can only be in there for a limited time, but you can get potions and whatnots to get more time within the shroud as well. And it honestly hasn't been an overbearing uh, ordeal. There are about four to five different biomes within the map of the game, which is cool because it changes up the aesthetics and the feel of the game as you explore. And the world traversal is actually really well made, which I kind of mentioned a little bit before, but you get this grapple and you can really traverse through the world and find puzzles and find hidden areas and secrets to really flesh out the experience. Those little puzzles add flair to the game that other survival games have lacked in the past. When you're trekking through the world and going through different biomes, you'll start to notice that the loot doesn't actually scale with you, it scales with the area. So if you're in a really difficult area with a bunch of level 20 things one-shotting you and absolutely murderizing every step of the way, you'll find better loot and it's actually rewarding to go into those areas early on. Unlike games where if you're a level 3 and you go into a level 20 area, no matter what, you're going to open a chest and find a level 3 weapon. I like to do this thing where I take off all of my clothes and run into the deadliest area within the game and then try to find cool things and loot them and bring them back without dying. It adds a level of fun and I don't know, it's silly, but it's cool. I like that it scales with the area and not with the player. It doesn't feel limiting, you know, and it rewards exploration. The survival elements within the game are not hardcore per se, which could be a good thing or a bad thing depending on your personal taste. You won't get hungry, you won't get thirsty, and you won't die from either of those aspects. Instead, food and water raise a certain statistic for a specific amount of time, depending on what food and drink you have at the time. This takes away from having to eat periodically and having to drink periodically to stay alive and puts you into more of a mindset of, hey, I should probably cook some food because I'm gonna go into a harder area of the game so I have a little bit of extra health while I'm out and about in my adventures. Crafting is a thing. It's really cookie cutter though. It's very much like every other survival game that I've ever played, which isn't a bad thing. It takes everything that, you know, works and implements it into this game. You know, as you progress through the areas and you progress through the quests, you get different types of materials and you can craft better things. The building though is a highlight of the game, I will say. There's two modes in the building mode. You can either have it snap onto other pieces of building and or you can have it in free mode where you can place it wherever you want. Free mode works really well and things actually snap together as you would expect them to instead of just doing these funky things because they don't want to work with the terrain that you're on. You're able to manipulate terrain like make holes or make mountains. And there's a lot of little decoration tiny things that you can put everywhere to make your castle, home, whatever it is that you're making feel more alive. Another cool thing about the building, at least for me, is that it is very forgiving. It doesn't take into consideration gravity or having supports for the buildings that you make. It really just works. <laughs> it's a magical land. They weren't thinking there were going to be some architects trying to build these things. They don't care about supports. If you take out the bottom floor of something, the rest of it stays floating. It's actually <laughs> really silly looking sometimes. So for example, in my storage room, I had put my little storage crates on a shelf and then I deleted the shelf on accident and looked at it and they were just floating there and thought, that looks kind of magical. I'll leave it like that. So again, I think this goes heavily by opinion, whether or not you're going to like those systems within the building. If you like it to be a little bit more hardcore and you want gravity to be a thing, then you probably won't enjoy those systems. But if you don't want to take it as seriously and you just want to build something that looks really cool based off of what you want to do with it, based off of your own creation, your own magical world, then that's going to be something that you're going to really enjoy. I mentioned the NPCs earlier, like the blacksmith, having those guys be readily available and you can spawn them and leave them wherever you like is really cool because it adds to the customization of your base. For example, my little blacksmith dude is in a room that's made out of stone and it's got a forge next to it and it's got a little anvil. So I was able to aesthetically make a blacksmith area while also having all of the tools and crap that I needed to upgrade my weapons. So it's a fun little thing that they added that you can customize your NPCs and where you want them to be based on what they do. Quests are important in this game. You're free to explore however you want. You're free to go out and do whatever you want within the map of the game. But of course, it nudges you in the right direction if you want to quickly progress and do the next main thing. You can get quests from the NPCs. You can also find little journal notes that'll lead you into another direction. And or you can go to a quest that's just marked on your map a little 
question mark symbol and you go there and you figure out what you need to do then. On your journey, you'll notice that you also level up your character. Those levels will grant you skill points, which you can then use to put into your skill tree. This is a really cool feature in a game like this because it adds build variety and the gameplay really tailors to your gameplay style. It's really adaptable for somebody who really likes to try different skills because you can reset your skill points pretty easily and then go into different skills within your skill tree. Normally in survival games like this, you don't have character progression, you have world progression. So the better armor you have, the better your stats will be. But if you take that armor off, those stats go away. Versus in this game where you add it to their skill tree, it doesn't matter if you're naked and you have no weapon, you keep those stats no matter what. So that's really cool, but there is a max level for the game, which is level 25 for your character. You get a little bit more skill points than you do levels. So for example, when I was level three, I already had seven skill points somehow. So I think it is a little bit more lenient, but I do not believe that you can get all of the skills within your skill tree filled to the max. You can't become a giga chad god character. In order to reset your skill points, like I mentioned before, you can get these runes. You get runes from killing certain enemies and they drop them, or you can get them from dismantling or scrapping your weapons. This is a cool feature because there's a lot of crap weapons or trash weapons that you get throughout the playthrough and you can actually put those to use instead of throwing them over a cliff and hoping to never see them again within your world. Building a massive hole and throwing all your trash loot in there. For items that you can't scrap, or I believe it's called salvage within the game, you can actually just straight up delete them. They, they thought about that one. So I mentioned how you can use runes to reset your skill points, but you can also use them to level up weapons. When you upgrade a weapon, you're actually adding a perk to the weapon that gives you a little stat bonus, and you can upgrade it multiple times depending on the rarity of the weapon. If you have a common weapon, you can upgrade it like two times and if you have a legendary weapon for example you can upgrade it like five times i don't know these are just numbers i'm throwing out but that's the basic gist of weapon upgrading we covered exploration we covered character building and base building we covered loot, weapons and i don't think we covered armor too much but i didn't feel like it was honestly unique or anything special or worth mentioning it's your basic you get a piece of armor it gives you a stat on the piece of armor and you can get different pieces of armor as you progress through the game but now it's time to move on to the game's potential. Multiplayer lobbies have the potential to be these massive, uniquely created worlds, given the fact that you can have so many people in the lobby if the multiplayer issues are addressed and fixed. From what I've been seeing, especially being a part of the Discord, of the Enshrouded Discord, is that a lot of people are playing this game solo and they're enjoying this game more in a solo setting. The quests have been unique for the most part and rewarding in their own way, you know, as far as progression goes, but there's absolutely no cinematic presentation to them. The lore is presented to you in the form of, hey, you find a little note and you read it and it tells you a little bit about the lore in the area that you're in, which is, is cool in a certain way, but I wish there was more. They can do so much with the story, which by the way is really intriguing and the lore is really cool so far. They can do so much with it by just adding voice lines or adding cutscenes when you go into a certain area. Little things, little details like that to make the game a little bit more intriguing for a story heavy lover like myself would be really really cool and they have the potential to do so really easily they've already created a really cool opening cutscene now do that with the rest of the game i shouldn't say easy because i've never developed a game so let me omit that i will say it could be doable it is it's doable and they could do it and i would love to see that in the game Anyway, the shroud has the potential to be so much scarier. They can honestly take a note from the original Dying Light. When you're playing through that game during the day, it's cool, handy dandy, you're killing zombies, you're beating people up. It's a little bit challenging or whatever, but for the most part, you're progressing and then it's nighttime and you're like, oh my God. No, don't, don't put me out there at night. You have to run away from the murderous assholes that are trying to rip your head from your body. And it's just a completely different feeling, even though it's the same map, same everything, but the enemies and the aesthetic and you know the music and the soundtrack just changes the entire feel of the game at night the shroud has a little bit of that but not to the extreme where like i wouldn't go into the shroud because i'm scared to die like it's it's really become routine to hop into the shroud grab some shroud wood and then leave without really running into any issues or any potential scary monsters killing me or whatever the shroud enemies have for the most part been the same amount of scary as any other enemy within the game so unless they were just going for the factor of you go in there for 
limited time and you get out, then I don't know, I add some oomph to it. Add some horror, add some scary, add some add some danger, add more rarity to the items within the shroud so that when I go in there, even though the stakes are higher so, or the reward, something like that. So being that this is early access and hopefully they'll listen to a lot of feedback and still have a long way to go for the full release of the game, I can see a lot of quality of life improvements bring, being brought to the final product. We've talked about the potential, but now let's look at what the promises are, what the devs have actually said is coming in the future for this game. There's a little bit of a problem with this. Um, so they haven't said anything. <laughs> no, I mean, let me clarify. There's no roadmap for the future for this game. There's no actual, hey, these are what's going to be different from early access versus the full release of the game, which at first I thought it was a bad thing. I was looking at it, saw that there was no roadmap and thought to myself, really, like, how are we supposed to be excited for what is to come, what the future holds for the full release of this game? But then I read one of their excerpts from the Steam page, which reads, hey there, we're working on our roadmap internally. We're curious to see what features and improvements people are interested in. And of course, we want to ensure that we take care of all major issues, crashes, and consorts before we move on to the topic of what's coming next. We're hoping to have more info and perhaps even a roadmap itself within two weeks of release. So that tells me a couple of things. They're looking for feedback. They're really wanting to see what people think about the game and what people want to see out of the game, which is awesome. And that's probably why they're waiting to release any information for the roadmap because they're changing and tailoring and tweaking based off of people's feedback. Two weeks should be an ample amount of time for them to check out the feedback and really change and tweak the roadmap in ways that they only have to release it once instead of having to release a roadmap now and then change it again in the future. Avoiding issues like how Overwatch 2 devs did it, where they told us that they were gonna give us a bunch of PvE things and then they ended up just lying. Reading through the forums and seeing what people have been asking and what they've been responding, I did find that future updates reveal that they'll expand on building tools, they'll fix a bunch of progress loss issues that people have been having, and also that they're gonna tweak resource spawning to kind of balance out the game a little bit. From one of the few things they actually said about the game, we can expect more biomes, we can expect an expanded map, and we can expect more enemies and more crafting materials, but those are just generalized things, so they haven't really specified anything. I also found out that the devs aren't opposed to making like base raids from the enemies depending on feedback and what people want to see out of the enemies because currently you don't get attacked if you're in your base the little flame protects you the enemies don't even spawn in your area they can't attack your base they can't attack you while you're in your base so that may be changing in the future for the full release other than that though there has been very little to no talk on the game's full release we know that they plan on releasing it for the consoles for other consoles rather than it just being on steam because the early access version of it is only steam when they were asked approximately how long will this game will be in early access they said it depends on our feedback the current goal is to take the game out of early access within a year so that's not really a release date more of a time frame for a full release of the game lastly we're looking at dev activity within the game Unlike the day before, where the devs pretty much released the game and then jumped ship, never to be heard from again, these devs have been really active within the Discord, giving us a lot of information about the patches and the hotfixes that have come out since the game's release, which is cool because when they're saying, hey, we want feedback, you can tell they mean it because of how they interact with their community. Because of the fact that the devs have been super active since the game's release, we can definitely expect them to continue that and continue to put out updates and patches. And, you know, the game will change exponentially throughout its life lifetime as an early access game before its full release. Only time will tell what they actually have in mind, but I have a good feeling about this company. You can tell they put a lot of heart and soul and effort into this game, and they're not just some people trying to get some money off of us by putting out this shell of a game. This game actually has a lot of potential. I mean, at the end of the day, it's just really good already. The devs did mention that the game is going to be cheaper in early access, so when the full release of the game comes out, it's going to be I don't know how much more, but more than the early access version of the game, which has been done plenty of times in the past. I think it's very fair to do. You know, the game isn't full. It isn't done completely. So they're going to put it out for a specific price and then change the price when they feel the game is ready to be fully released. That's the whole point of making a game early access in the first place. What sets this game apart from others as far as being early access is that it's fantastic. It's a fantastic game already. They could have released this today and said, hey, it's ready to go. It's full price and it is a full game. And I would have believed them. Like, I really, truly believe that this is a really well put together game. It's got a lot of value to it. It's got a lot of or behind it. And there's just an exponential amount of things to do within this game that will suck you up dry and spit you out and leave you wondering why the real world isn't like enshrouded. So just that alone makes this 
a really easy question to answer. <laughs> yes, this game I wholeheartedly believe is worth buying in early access. Keep in mind when it comes to something like this though, that the details that I mentioned before, if you don't like certain aspects of the game, whether it's fully fleshed out or not, you're not gonna like this game. If you're not a survival game liker or lover, or you don't generally play games that are like this because you don't enjoy the mechanics, then it's not like this is gonna change your mind. This is very much a survival game through and through. It's just a very well-made survival game that has a lot of potential to become even better over time. I would love to... I would absolutely love to hear from you guys. I wanna know if you have been playing this game, what you're hoping to see. If you haven't been playing this game, are you going to play it based off of this video? Have I convinced you to buy the game? You guys can hit me up down here in the comments. I'll be active there and or you guys can hit me up in the Discord. We have the community server that is full of absolutely amazing people. We play games, we have community nights and everything in between. So if you guys wanna join the conversation, maybe play Enshrouded with me and the crew, maybe play some Fortnite. We play all sorts of other different things or have just good old video game discussions. You guys join the Discord if you haven't joined already. What are you doing with your lives? If you wanna see more videos like this, of course, we have have these types of videos we have let's plays we have game guides we have game reviews our page is just full of awesome things for gamer nerds like myself and copac and senna so go ahead and hit that subscribe button hit that like button because it helps me out it helps the videos reach the algorithm gods but other than all that crap thank you guys for watching i appreciate you and i'll see you in the next one bye